This program was developed in conjunction with the Western North Carolina Mission Engagement Team and the Western North Carolina Disaster Response Committee on Relief. Welcome. We're going to spend the next time reflecting on how we got here, review our role as an ERT, and outline the role and responsibilities of the District Disaster Response Coordinator. Let's take a few moments to remember the scripture which is special to you in your life and leading into disaster response. Maybe it's Galatians 1.12 or Romans 12.5 through 8 or Colossians 3.17 or one of the many others that means something to you. Take time to reflect on your verse or verses and how it applies. Today, our program overview, we're going to prepare to coordinate. Uh, we, are, we are providing a caring Christian presence leading up to, during, and in the aftermath of a disaster. We're going to focus on why and how did I get here, who is in this with me, and understanding disaster response coordination. Let's remember on what got you here. So how or why did you become a disaster response volunteer? How or why did you become a leader? And as part of your ERT training, uh, you took the uh, covenant commitment. So let's take a moment to uh, recite along with me the covenant uh, that, you, that we took before. With the grace of God and the support of my colleagues in UMCOR and UMVIM, I will treat all people involved in the disaster as children of God and worthy of my respect. Regard the congeniality of my fellow workers as a gift from God. Seek to understand and support the variety of roles needed in disaster response. Ask for the guidance of the Holy Spirit in discerning my role. Practice good stewardship of my own resources and those of the various disaster volunteer teams, understanding that the funding of the work of the UMVIM is the responsibility of the volunteers and that general advanced funds collected by UMCOR for a disaster are distributed within an annual conference by the conference leadership. Be ready to listen as a ministry of healing. Avoid taking sides in local dynamics that may be exacerbated in a disaster. Hold fast as a disciple of Jesus Christ in the midst of the chaos of disaster. Mindful of the suffering of Christ and the suffering of others, I hereby make my commitment, holding myself accountable to my colleagues in disaster response and in seeking to be mutually supportive at every opportunity. We're going to do a quick refresher on information from your ERT training. So what is a disaster? Well, a disaster is a specific event that results in overwhelming physical, economic, and or emotional damage. It causes significant harm to people and property. It disrupts the normal pattern of living. It overwhelms a community's ability to respond. It may affect individuals, families, neighborhoods, communities, or whole regions. The disaster types that typically are the area of response for ERTs are floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, ice, and wildfires. There are other disasters that typically ERTs are not involved in and those include technical disasters, economic, civil, pandemic, accidents, and war. As we look at this slide, we can see on the left-hand slide, this is flooding after Hurricane Harvey. In the upper right-hand corner are results of the tornadoes in Joplin, Missouri. And the lower right-hand corner, we see uh, the results of the wildfires in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. As we look at the map, we can see that North Carolina is prone to all types of natural disasters, whether it's the moderate risk or high risk of earthquakes. We have flood damage, uh, usually annually, 
Uh, we have hurricanes. We're in a hurricane prone region of the United States and we also have tornadoes. So just what is emergency preparedness and how do we uh, get ready for a disaster? So let's review here are the parts of a disaster and what, ca what classifies as a disaster. The phases of the disaster are the readiness phase. It's where we are today. We review past disasters. We learn from those disasters. We put in place prevention from what we've learned and what we've experienced in the past. We plan for future disasters. We prepare, we train, we coordinate with other agencies and most important of all, we communicate. The next phase is the rescue. That is during or immediately after the rescue uh, or disaster, excuse me. The uh, rescue phase is set uh, by emergency management. It is the disaster itself. And that also is a basis for us as it is our number of days of disaster. Our next phase is the relief phase. It immediately follows the rescue and begins the damage control. Families are returning home in need of assistance. Their assistance may come physically, emotionally, or spiritually. This is when the ERTs come into action. This phase is generally 10 times the disaster phase. So for instance, if your rescue phase is seven days, then your relief phase would be 70 days. And our last phase of a disaster is the recovery. It's everything returning to a no normal or revised normal, a new normal, uh, whatever it may be with the survivor. Uh, it will not be the same, uh, things do change. The recovery is generally 10 times the relief phase. So if our relief phase was 70 days, our recovery phase is gonna be 700 days. Now let's look at the disaster. Uh, the levels of disaster, uh, our first is low. It's limited households, it's less than 50. It come, the help comes from local churches and within the district with the district superintendent's notification. Uh, these are small uh, uptick storms that you have uh, that causes some really localized damage that uh, usually the local communities or neighboring communities can handle. Our next level is a medium level. It's 50 to 100 households. It involves an entire community along with possibly neighboring communities. It, it takes an organized response through the district uh, disaster coordinator along with the district superintendent. The next level is high. It is your 100 to 200 households. It is wide area, it is massive and it takes state and national agencies to help respond. A conference-wide response assisting districts and local churches is needed during a high-level disaster. The final level of disaster is catastrophic. It is 200 households plus. It overwhelms uh, the surrounding government, uh, non-government agencies. Uh, it requires a federal response. Uh, it is so widespread that it takes in most of the agencies that would act within a region. A conference assistance is through a ju jurisdictional uh, coordination. So what are the roles of the ERT during a disaster? First and foremost, we provide a caring Christian presence. We're respectful, we're sensitive to their needs, we're caring, we're non-judgmental, and, we and we're very flexible. Uh, we do no harm. We are not a building or repair team. Uh, we must have the homeowner's permission to be there. Uh, we do not do anything that would jeopardize uh, a survivor's chance of an insurance claim. Uh, we prevent further damage. Uh, we do tarping, debris removal, cleaning out of damaged homes, but we are not promise makers. We manage. Uh, donated materials, we gather information as we go out in site assessments and home assessments and or other such tasks that may be needed by the district or disaster response coordinators. We observe the survivor's needs and report that to the local coordinators. 
we must be mindful of the surroundings that are, that are happening around that survivor. We're a listening ministry. We enable recovery. And if in doubt, we refer. The most important thing to remember here is even if we're just standing there, the survivor knows they're not alone. We must meet the physical needs of the survivor. Uh, as they uh, come through this disaster, uh, the physical needs is going to be uh, most important. They, they will disregard their safety, their belongings, their self-esteem, or their purpose uh, to meet these needs, uh, whether it's food and water, uh, it's sleep, uh, whatever it may be. So as you uh, develop your plans for your district uh, in conjunction with your other district coordinators, you need to keep these things in mind. Uh, your plans must meet the needs of the survivors. Next, for us, in order for a survivor to get through a disaster, they, they're going to have to accept what happened. Uh, as part of our caring ministry, we need to understand that these uh, survivors need to go through uh, these four phases of the grief. Uh, they're going to have to experience the pain. They're going to have to adjust to their new surroundings, uh, their new way of life. Uh, it's it's going to be new on the other side. And then they have to reinvest in that new. Uh, for uh, uh, just taking time leading up to and during the disasters, the, the survivors are going to go through uh, several phases of the, of the disaster. Uh, prior to the disaster, its life is normal. Uh, but after that, the storm impacts them. And uh, that's when, after the storm, they get through that and the fire department shows up and the police department and EMS and emergency management rescue folks are there. Uh, and it begins that heroic phase or honeymoon that, hey, the knights in shining armor are here. But after a day or two or three, uh, those folks leave. Uh, they have to go back. They're, they're not there permanently. And then there becomes a downward spiral. And that's where the ERTs come into place. Uh, we come in during this time of disillusionment. Uh, it is uh, um, times when uh, depression can set in. Uh, and there are a lot of uh, signs and symptoms of, of this depression. Uh, and these folks have to go through this. But then uh, they, they begin to come out of that. And when they come up and, and as an ERT, this is when we can uh, bring hope uh, to the survivors. Uh, once that's established and they start building themselves out of it, then they can come back into their new or revised life uh, after, after the disaster. The ERT teams, uh, few rules for them. All members must be 18 or older. They must be trained with uh, current certifications, and that is an encore training, and they have to have the ability to respond. Uh, you have to have invitations for out-of-district responses. Teams uh, have to have required resources. There's funding, uh, volunteers, equipment, and the ability to be self-sustaining. Uh, you must have proper documentation with each team member. Uh, you adhere, all the teams adhere to all safe sanctuary policies and procedures. And remember that the ERT teams are first in and last out. Um, UNCOR, uh, as you know, provides us with the funding and UNVIM provides us with the volunteers. So that kind of ends our segment on ERTs. Uh, res resources for your ERTs, uh, the three main resources that you have are the three Ps. You need a payer, you need a player, and you need a prayer. Uh, prayers are very important for an ERT team. Uh, ben Rogers is our conference disaster response coordinator, and it, here is his email address, and Kaylee Franklin is our training coordinator. And also there's some information on the conference uh, mission response website as well. So let's talk a little bit about disaster response and the roles that are, are played in a disaster response. The first is, is who plays what part? Uh, this is referenced from a disaster response plan for the, for the 
for the conference and you can find that on the conference website. The first is the bishop. He is our conference leader. He appoints specific response committees and leadership. He applies for grants and tours the affected areas with leadership for firsthand knowledge. During a disaster, he will re remain in contact with conference coordinators, will provide assistance to those coordinators, and can relieve the duties of an effective coordinator if he is called up into disaster and he also supplies the temporary replacements. He makes conference-wide appeals on behalf of affected areas. The Conference Disaster Response Committee uh, is an advocate for the survivors. He recruits leadership for disaster preparedness. It establishes policy, guidelines, and determines the strategies for disaster response. It establishes communication with conference coordinators, emergency management, and North Carolina VOAD. Active in disaster preparedness and supports the conference coordinators and creates an executive committee with decision-making empowerment and the ability to release funding during this disaster. The conference disaster coordinator uh, is Ben Rogers. He is vice chair of the conference disaster response committee on relief. He works closely in developing and implementing conference disaster plans. During a disaster, he communicates with the bishop and the cabinet. He assigns an incident coordinator and assesses damage with the incident and district coordinators. He establishes a disaster coordination office, staffs it as required with the necessary workspace, depending on the size and, uh, of the disaster and the needs of that disaster. He also makes appeals and encourages the conference to give financially and personally throughout the entire disaster. He writes grants for all disaster needs and forwards to the bishop for submittal. He supports affected districts throughout the entire disaster and appeals to other United Methodist Church agencies for relief. Mindful of the total disaster from prevention to recovery, and he keeps the annual conference updated throughout the whole throughout the year, uh, whether it is in prevention or recovery. The cabinets and the local district superintendents, they appoint the disaster response coordinator and introduces the coordinator to the local churches. They are familiar with the conference disaster plan and those associated with the conference and local, at local district level. They identify locations for shelter, feeding stations, warehouse receiving and distribution, and they make preliminary decisions for those locations, along with the local conference coordinators to ensure that these facilities are adequate uh, when the disaster uh, happens. They communicate with conference leadership during disaster. They receive initial reports from church-owned and community damage from district coordinator. And as part of the district assessment team, is including the district coordinator and the district lay leader. A company's conference leadership on tour of damaged areas and responses provides caregivers for the communities experiencing loss of life. That may be uh, counselors or whatever. They assist the local pastors, uh, providing replacements in cases where the local pastor uh, may be experiencing injury or death of his congregation or uh, of the pastor himself. He provides additional pastors to curb any overwhelming situations, he extends time frames for extenuating circumstances, and communicates on a regular basis to prevent or mitigate any burnout in the local leadership. He appeals to unaffected churches uh, and districts for assistance, and within the authority of the office appoints persons to certain tasks to serve on the disaster recovery board. The District Disaster Response Coordinator, uh, this is what we came here for. Uh, the buck stops here. It, it all comes down to the District Response Coordinator. You're responsible for the team that you create. Teamwork makes dream work. It, it, once you have your team in place, uh, it makes things go a lot easier. You're committed to the disaster response to the conference policies and procedures. 
this is not a title. You must be a current ERT and you must maintain a current status. The appointee must be able to commit to the responsibilities of the position, whether it's during as a disaster, prior or after. You participate in basic disaster response training as planned by the annual conference and taught by an UNCOR representative. You attend the Southeastern Jurisdiction training event at least once a quadrennium, and you must remain current in disaster response. Uh, it's easy to take a class every two years or every three years, but you need to remain current uh, with your disaster response plan so that you know um, what the current trends are, what current policies are, and, and, the, and the changes in those policies. You create, you maintain, and you lead your district disaster response committee. Your committee should have a representative mixture of your district churches. You develop and establish the district, the policies, the guidelines, and determine these strategies specifically for your represented district. Our districts in the Western North Carolina Conference are different. Each has different needs, some are similar, uh, but all are different in their own way. You work with the cabinet and the district superintendents to appoint as an assistant district response coordinator to serve in large disasters or if you're directly involved in the disaster. Your assistant should be familiar with the district response plan just as you are. Should reside in a different area of your district. If both of you are in the same neighborhood and the same neighborhood is affected, then you know, we've got two folks out. So it's good uh, on a larger to even have more uh, assistance, if, if you will, uh, but in different parts of the, of the district. Uh, you can uh, call on an, uh, an adjacent district coordinator to serve as your assistant, but that person should be as familiar with the district plan as you or any of your assistants would be. You inform the district and churches on how to prepare for a disaster before it happens. You create and maintain a disaster preparedness program for distribution. This distribution can be through social media, broadcast emails through the local church. Uh, you can utilize conference resources where available, and there are a lot of other non-government agency resources available and government resources at that point for your information to develop your plan. You work with the district churches to get volunteer uh, church and district data prior to the disaster. It, the more knowledge we have of your district, what it's made of, and who you have, the better off we'll be. You work to have all churches support at least one ERT team or combine with surrounding churches to create a team. We understand uh, at the conference level that not all churches can support a seven to 10 member ERT team. Uh, we know that uh, sometimes it's tough, but maybe you have one person, but if you can put them with another team uh, and, and bring those groups together, uh, that's good as well. What we need from each district is, is as many ERT teams as possible. You coordinate your ERT training, recertification classes with the district churches, the conference training coordinator, and the conference ERT coordinator. You maintain your certification database for the district and you submit an updated roster each June to the conference disaster response coordinator, the conference training coordinator, and the conference ERT team coordinator. This database needs to include the capabilities of the individual teams, the skill level, specialties that this team may have, the disaster, domestic disaster response uh, experience of the team and the team members, any work-related skill or experience that the team members would have, and all the required documentation for each team member. And the required documentation uh, can be found on um, the Brick River uh, website of the conference. It's the ERT uh, team volunteer registration, it's their liability release forms, medical release forms, training requests, uh, response teams application, advanced ERT team application and supporting documentation for the advanced team and chainsaw training, uh, special documentation for those folks. Uh, while we're here, 
Uh, let's talk just a minute about advanced teams. Uh, these are specialized ERT teams that are, are far beyond what a basic ERT team can do. They're generally made up of professionals in the team's specialty. For instance, uh, you have uh, an ERT T team, which is tree service. These are for tree clearing uh, applications. You have uh, a chaplain specialty team. We have wind and water teams that excel in mucking, tarping, and mold prevention. We have management teams made up of those experienced in site and damage assessments and managing uh, warehousing and that sort of thing. We have food teams. They're able to prepare meals for large groups on a continuous basis. These could be teams made up of, of cooks from schools, chefs, or, or whatever is in your district that could come together to create a team. There's a vessel team. Uh, these are boat teams experienced in water rescue. These are generally made up of fire and rescue personnel. There's a search and rescue team. They're able to assist local respond, responders. These folks can go in ahead of time uh, during the rescue phase as part of the, our, our conference response because these guys are generally made up of fire and rescue personnel as well. They have the credentials that can let them respond even though they're not responding with a local uh, department or agency. Uh, there's a logistics team that is, is for warehousing and distribution, obtaining supplies and, and that that you would need uh, for whatever supplies it may be during a disaster. Uh, these teams can uh, usually respond without an invitation. Uh, they are on a uh, agreed upon response um, and they are actually a, um, a district team. However, they are sponsored uh, through a local church. Uh, so you need to have a local church that would, would sponsor this team as their home base, if you will. Uh, these teams have to do uh, training for all types of uh, self-sustaining, just like any ERT team would do. Uh, so they are, a, a, like I said, a, a specialized team uh, made up of professionals uh, in their area of expertise. You would, as a coordinator, you develop and maintain your district's response plans for local disasters based on the type of disaster that you have and the size of that disaster. You develop and maintain the district mutual aid response plans for out of district disasters with other district coordinators based on the capabilities of your district teams. Uh, you develop and maintain response plans for out of conference state and jurisdiction disasters after your invitation. And you provide input into conference advanced specialty ERT teams training and response plans. So to back up just a minute, our mutual aid response plan uh, is an agreement with districts outside of your local district or conference lines that create the ability to respond with, with designated experienced teams or advanced teams without a disaster invitation. Uh, these respond before the invitations are issued and they're in cases, uh, and in case it could be before the emergency phase is complete. Uh, as you talk with your other um, adjacent coordinators, as you come together uh, annually to meet and discuss your disaster response plans, this is when you make your mutual aid agreements. Uh, that way that you could, if uh, a disaster happens, and it's overwhelming, then uh, another uh, district's team could come in and help you set up your uh, disaster response office, for instance, or they could help get started on tree clearing. While things are really confusing, they can be come in and help provide you the leadership uh, that you need to get folks started uh, as you uh, kind of wrap your arms around your disaster and what you have. So it's, it's real important to have these agreements, uh, not only with your uh, adjacent districts, but also as you, uh, those districts that are across, con that adjacent to conference lines, you would have those with uh, out of conference districts as well. You identify and relate to any local response organizations, uh, your 
any emergency service organizations or emergency management office prior to and during the disaster. It is really important that you get to know the folks from your emergency management uh, leadership teams and the agencies within your district. Uh, these are city and county emergency managers. These are gonna be your police chiefs and your sheriffs, uh, your police departments, sheriff departments, the local chaplains for those departments, uh, your fire, your emergency medical folks, your rescue chiefs, uh, emergency and non-emergency or convalescent medical transport folks, and your community emergency response teams. It's good that you know uh, these folks and they know you and your capabilities as well. Uh, with a working relationship with this, uh, you're able to activate sooner uh, and provide uh, need where we're needed. Uh, as you can see in our, in our response plan, uh, the, the large response is th through the government and it tears down to us in the non-government uh, organizations. You need to be familiar with the other non-government -organ organizations and agencies that uh, come, into, come into play. Uh, they provide a grief and critical incident stress counselors, chaplains, and pastors. There's other denominational response organizations that are out there, Red Cross. There's the humanitarian shelters that are out there. Uh, and also the local schools, uh, your presidents, your chancellors, your superintendents, and your principals. Uh, local schools can be, during a disaster, a good place for uh, a command office, uh, a relief shelter, um, staging, uh, warehousing, uh, schools in, in a large disaster uh, can be very helpful. Um, some of your multi-voluntary uh, organizations that you have here, um, Salvation Army, Red Cross, Convoy of Hope, Catholic Charities, Billy Graham, Team Rubicon, Samaritan's Purse, uh, Habitat for Humanity, just to name a few. Uh, these are all part of North Carolina VOAD. You heard me mention that a while ago. Uh, that stands for North Carolina Organizations Active in a Disaster. Uh, the North Carolina is a chapter of the National VOAD. Uh, its role is to bring organizations active in dis disasters together enable them to understand each other, work together during times of disaster preparedness, a response, relief, and recovery through cooperation, communication, coordination, and collaboration. So it's good to know all the folks in, that are in your area that are a member of OAD. You have pre-planned and predetermined district uh, command posts. Like I said, schools become a, a good place for a command post. Uh, then you need to have multiple locations that could be possible command posts. Uh, you need to qualify their communication capabilities, uh, their temporary power capabilities, along with their shelter uh, in needs for command staff or uh, outside um, survivors. Um, when we talk about uh, communication capabilities, I know in some of our Western uh, Districts, you, uh, a church may be really familiar with the community uh, and, and uh, friendly to that community, and that's all well and good. But to be honest, if they only have one telephone line coming in, they're not going to serve you very well in a disaster response. So you need to uh, take those things, uh, phone, power, uh, ability to keep heat, uh, those things uh, during an air conditioning uh, during a disaster so that uh, the command post will, will work and serve you uh, well uh, during your time of need. Uh, you'll maintain an inventory of the disaster equipment of both the local churches, the district, and share a copy of that inventory with the conference disaster response coordinator and the conference ERT team coordinator. You establish this disaster response trailers with able churches, uh, they're not required of ERT teams, uh, but we would like them to have them. Uh, they work well for getting tools back and forth, providing the uh, you know, transportation needs uh, of getting uh, their equipment uh, to a site. Uh, so uh, if, if a church is able to provide for a trailer, uh, it's good to have one. Um, 
it needs to be based on the church's ability to maintain that trailer. Uh, the inventory, minimum inventory in the trailer should be adequate PPE for the sponsoring church's team or teams. Um, basic tools and supplies for an adequate response uh, to a local disaster. Um, and that's based on their location. Um, whether it's inner, inner city, suburban, or rural, um, those needs for what would, would you would have um, could be a little different. I, I think of, um, comes to mind, the Metro District. Uh, there are a lot of high-rise apartments uh, in, in the Charlotte region. Uh, if those were uh, caught up in a disaster or a, tor a tornado, or hurricane damage like we experienced with Hugo, um, there's not gonna be a lot of tarping in that thing. Uh, you're gonna have needs for food and shelter for a lot of folks. Uh, whereas uh, maybe in the Blue Ridge District uh, or Uwari District uh, in a tornado, uh, you may have a, a greater need um, for a chainsaw team, uh, for tree clearing and that sort of thing. Um, or uh, folks that can do uh, rescues in flooded areas or such. So it, it really depends. Uh, it needs to be custom designed uh, to the folks in your district and, and what those needs would be. Uh, any advanced team equipment capabilities, clearances or readiness needs to be in this inventory as well. So what happens when a disaster strikes or it's imminent? Well, the proper steps you need to take are one, notify the conference disaster response coordinator of a possible implementation of your district's response plan. You need to contact the local churches, pastors following a disaster to find out what happened. And if church, if the church property is involved, church folks are involved and, uh, and how that was affected, uh, how big an area, that sort of um, information is, is it's what's needed to be for you to start gathering. And then you need to keep the district superintendent informed of your whereabouts at, at all times. So in a disaster, uh, you need to be the eyes and ears uh, for, the, for the conference. Uh, you're, you're the boots on the ground. Uh, you need to be uh, in communication with us. You, you must communicate with the conference coordinator and the DS in, in real time. Uh, you need to work out this communication line, how are you going to do that uh, prior to a disaster. It, it should be part of your uh, pre-planning. So to determine the scope of damage, uh, you need to do that without getting in the way of emergency personnel. Uh, this information needs to be gathered as soon as possible. Uh, and the information uh, that you, uh, you, you gather to make informed decisions needs to be as accurate as possible. Uh, you need to know the amount and type of damage. It needs to, is, does it involve property damage only or does it include injuries or death? The area uh, of the damage, is it localized? Is it a community, communities, or widespread? Are homes livable or not? And the condition of the infrastructure roads, power, phone, et cetera. Uh, this information only needs to be with reliable information. Uh, not someone that's passed by that said, oh, you can't get down through there. Uh, this needs to come from your uh, emergency management folks, your fire, uh, your rescue, your police. Uh, that, that needs to be as, as accurate as possible from your energy providers as well. You contact, uh, the district superintendent, the disaster response coordinator, uh, the disaster relief committee chairperson, uh, as soon as possible following a disaster. Uh, that includes the mission engagement team folks as well. Uh, you need to have the contact or means to contact your assistant uh, if directly involved in that as well. So all these contacts uh, need to be part of your pre-plan uh, so that they can be implemented as well. And then it's that time um, where all the pre-planning and preparation pays off. Uh, and so I'll say to you in the spirit of Sheriff Andy Taylor, when he says, call the man, 
uh, it is time for you to implement the plan. You implement your, your disaster response plan. It's going to be based on your disaster pipe, uh, the extent of your damage, the loss of property or life, and, and the, the affected areas. Uh, it is time for you to issue invitations if they're warranted. Uh, you're going to assess damages uh, following that disaster with the uh, response coordinator and the appointed uh, incident coordinator. Uh, as required due to the size of the disaster, or by request, you deter the affected area uh, with the, the DS, uh, the district coordinators, the bishop, and conference communicator. Uh, that leadership team will come through if the disaster is large enough to see um, see firsthand, and, and you need to make yourself available. You can maintain contact with the conference coordinator throughout the rescue and relief phases of the disaster. Uh, and if you're directly involved, um, the district disaster representative would allow uh, the conference disaster response coordinator to uh, assume district uh, responsibilities. Uh, if you're involved, uh, we, we've got you back. And so there will be folks there to, to help you through this. Um, also, if there comes a time uh, in a disaster where it's just so overwhelming that you need to step away, we've got folks that uh, can step in and help you too. So, uh, uh, you know, remember, um, speak up and communicate. Uh, your support uh, for this uh, comes through the, um, Steve Cheney. He's the chairman of your mission engagement team. Uh, ben, again, is your conference, di uh, di uh, conference disaster response coordinator. Kaylee Franklin, who's your training coordinator. And again, uh, the conference website for additional information. Um, the conference uh, response uh, and operations, uh, are all of this is based on the disaster response plan for the conference, uh, the emergency reference guide, uh, and like I said before, all the required documentation um, is uh, on the conference website and through Brick River, uh, and it includes some additional forms that you will need uh, during the disaster, and that's the access to property, uh, advanced disaster response team, payment disaster emission uh, response donations, uh, evacuee liability release forms, site assessment forms, and volunteer daily report forms. So in conclusion, um, we can't forget the human element and remember uh, that a disaster belongs to the survivors or to the victims. Uh, we're providing a caring Christian presence. Uh, even if we just stand there, uh, we know they know that they're not alone. We let them know that. We, we provide hope. Uh, we do no harm. We follow our guidelines as the best as our situation will allow us. Uh, when we're in doubt, we ask and we communicate uh, to remember we're all in this together. So we'd like to thank you uh, on behalf of the, of the conference leadership team uh, for your dedication to uh, and commitment to disaster response. Uh, we thank you for your, your uh, willingness to serve uh, to this uh, really worthy role. Uh, may God bless you and bestow his blessings on you uh, as you take this undertaking. Thank you.